Welcome to the Jolly Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Barrett. This podcast is for those who are interested in the conversation around diversity, inclusion, and equity. Each week, I'll be interviewing a guest who has something special to share or is actively part of building solutions in this space. Let's get started. So Akita has over 20 years of international experience in retail financial services and payments with companies such as Elevon, MasterCard, Visa, Barclays, HSBC, and Citi across roles in strategy, business development, and product. Having lived and worked in five different countries, she brings a rich understanding of markets at different stages of development and diverse cultures across Asia, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. She completed her bachelor's from Delhi University and MBA from XLRI, Jamshedpur, both in India. Akita is passionate about people and relationships and has the opportunity to drive an impact in this space with her current role as diversity, equity, and inclusion champion at U.S. Bank. So please join me in welcoming Akita. I'm so glad to be speaking to you today. And I love the idea that you are a diversity, equity, and inclusion champion. Own that title. (laughs) So I just wanted to start out. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how you got to where you are today. And then we can dive in and and talk a little bit more about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Absolutely. Well, Melissa, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. And I'm quite looking forward to this conversation So growing up, I spent my years in Nigeria and did all my primary schooling in Lagos. And therefore, that was, I think, my very first experience in terms of living in a different environment and a different culture altogether. I then moved to India and did most of my secondary education, university and MBA in India before proceeding to join the financial services industry and work for a number of large brands like AB and Amro and Citi in retail financial services. And um, then had an opportunity to move to Dubai and work for HSBC. Again, very different experience, um, even though culturally Dubai is a great mix in terms of different populations, but again, very, very different. And then learning the dynamics of being in a different religious state altogether. I had an opportunity to move to the UK after that, worked in London um, with Barclays as part of their global strategy team, exposure to different international markets, understanding the macro environment and also the cultural differences in play. And uh, things worked out and turned in such a way that I then was able to move to Singapore and work with Visa, something that you and I share in common, Melissa. And... um, Again, Singapore is a great mix of different populations, but a very, very different environment to what I had experienced either in the UK or in the Middle East or in India or Nigeria for that matter. Very, very small country, but so much to learn from how they have evolved and developed into the place that they are right now. And then eventually came back to the UK and have been back in London for about six years. So for me, I think the two good things about my journey is not just the exposure to different parts of retail financial services and payments and different leading organizations, but most importantly, understanding the different markets, the different environments, and the diverse set of backgrounds and experiences that I've had the opportunity to come across. I have a new learning every day in terms of how people operate, what they think, what is important to them. And I think that journey is going to continue for a while. That's awesome. And really, I mean, if we think about it, I mean, women in payments, in the payment space is is also, I won't say it's rare, but it's, you know, you don't necessarily have lots of women in payments. Now that you're in London, what is the... What is the um, culture like in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Because it feels like things are are changing over there as well. And as we look at all of the social justice emphasis around the world, we have, you know, I've seen like a change happening. 
So what's what's the scene like in London now? So I think the advantage that we have in London, Melissa, is that it is a big metropolis. It is one of the biggest financial centers in the world and therefore attracts people from all over the world to come and work here, right? So by its very nature and because of the industries that it survives on, there is a huge diversity of the populations that live and work here. And in line with that, there has been a lot of progress made in terms of hiring practices, in terms of how talent is managed and looking for a diverse set of skills and experiences. Increasingly, London is also trying to move towards being a fintech hub and therefore that younger population, new skills coming into play as well. Having said that, there is still a lot of work to be done, I think, on two fronts in particular. One is advancing women in leadership positions. There is a lot of conversation around having more women on boards. Uh, In particular, organizations like the 30% Club are very, very active and prevalent in the UK and across Europe as well. And that is precisely because we don't have enough women represented on boards. Right. And so there needs to be a concerted effort to work towards that. I think the second aspect you just spoke about, you know, justice and social um, background. We still have a lot of work to do in terms of representation and giving more of a hand to our BAME communities, which is the Black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities and also other minority groups in terms of giving them the foundation to enter a level playing field as far as education, work, advancement, and all of those things come, right? So we have a sizable representation from those minority groups in the population that we have here, but not enough concerted work had been done up until now. And what the pandemic has reflected over the course of 2020 is that these groups have got more adversely affected than others because of the lack of infrastructure, because of the conditions that they live in, because of the lack of the skills that they need to get the right opportunities. And therefore, this year, we're beginning to see a shift with the likes of Lloyd's Banking Group and Standard Chartered, some of the largest banking operations in London announcing a specific commitment to measuring and closing the black pay gap and taking specific steps to address it. So yes, a change is happening. We have a way to go to get to a comfortable position. Yeah. And you've been doing diversity, equity, and inclusion for a while. Can you talk about, you know, some of the things that you have done, what's, you know, what's been helpful, what's worked, what maybe hasn't, and kind of, you know, what does that, has that journey kind of led you in terms of where you or your companies that you've worked for have been in terms of integration into the business from a a DE&I perspective? So Melissa, that's a, you know, fantastic question, really. I'm not sure I would have all the right answers, but I'll certainly tell you my experience. That'd be great. I think the two prerequisites for um, making progress from a diversity, equity, inclusion perspective. One is around leadership commitment, not just from an organizational standpoint, but from a broader, the communities that we live and work in and around us. It's very important to have the right leadership commitment to not just say, yes, we want to focus on this, but be committed to taking the actions needed to get there. I think that's one very important prerequisite. The other one really is in terms of awareness, right? So whether it's an awareness of cultural differences or other differences, whether it's an awareness of the unconscious biases that we hold, we we all be well-intentioned. I can very safely say that there'll be a very negligible population who would intentionally want to discriminate in the world that we live in today. But even with the best of intentions, sometimes we do not understand how our actions and words could be construed in a very different way by our colleagues and teams and other people that we live with just because we do not understand their context better. 
And so that awareness, both from a cultural standpoint as well as an unconscious bias standpoint, that self-awareness and an understanding of the context that we operate in is step one to then identifying the right guiding tools and ways that we can continue to work and collaborate despite those biases and differences that exist. So having laid down those prerequisites, I think, you know, if we are able to address both of those, we would make huge progress from a foundational perspective in then being able to show some impact and progress in moving upwards. Yeah, that's fantastic. So when you think about commitment and the actions that follow, because I think, you know, there are a lot of CEOs from the top down that are committed. And I think if you ask them, they would say, yes, I'm I'm all in. I want to focus on diversity, equity, inclusion. And it's the activities and the actions and sometimes even the accountability that people get tripped up around. Um, Because I always say diversity, equity, and inclusion to me is the business case for diversity, equity, and inclusion. (laughs) And so like, if you can't do diversity, equity, and inclusion in terms of how you're taking those actions and activities and integrating them into the business with your own diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of it, it becomes really challenging to actually see progress. And so are there certain suggestions or things with some of the leaders that you've talked to that um, you could share? So I can certainly think of three things, you know, top of mind. The first is in terms of whether diversity is considered just a good thing to do or it's considered as a part of the business itself. So to your point, right, it has to be the mainstay of how we work and operate, not just a thing that we do off the side of our desk. And that is reflected in multiple ways, right? It is a function of where in your organization does diversity sit? Is it placed at the right level with the right accountability and empowerment, right? It's also a function of how it's embedded into business objectives and the business initiatives that are taking place, whether it's in respect of business marketing or a diverse range of suppliers. So it's not limited to just recruiting and managing the right talent, which gives us that representation, but it gets integrated in how business is done and represented at the right levels in the organization. I think the second piece is for all of us, right? Um, When we go to work, sure, a large part of the excitement and passion about our work is because we enjoy doing what we do. But at the same time, no one's going to deny that a part of it is also, do we get compensated well enough for what we do, right? And therefore, the underlying assumption is that what gets measured actually gets done. So having a concrete set of measures and objectives and aspirations, which translate into real numbers that get tracked, reported on, not just internally, but in the form of external commitments as well, makes a huge difference in the progress on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then I think the final piece in there is about the leaders committing to the actions that get determined by the employees collectively, right? So it is great to say, I think we should do A, B, and C for our employee base, But if that feedback comes through the employees themselves, through either the form of employee engagement surveys or other focus groups or business resource groups, that becomes even more powerful. And if the leaders actually sponsor those actions, that's where I think the proof, the pudding lies in, in terms of are they really falling behind or are they actually supporting what the employees really feel is going to create a difference? Yeah, those are those are great areas. I think the, you know, and when we think about employee feedback, collaboration, the way we develop products, we go out and get information from the market. So that's kind of the same thing when I when I keep talking about the business case, it's like 
What are your employees saying? What do they want? But then even as a function of that, if we pivot to, you know, say a corporation, U.S. Bank, for example, has an outwardly facing um, brand. And what does that mean to the community itself on a broader basis? And so are there things that um, you think companies can do externally? You know, I think I know you've you've had different conferences and and things. Are there are there things that you would suggest to bring some additional attention and activity to corporations around the world? Absolutely. Right. So one of the simplest routes for corporations is to commit funding to the right causes, right, which support making progress in the right direction, right? So whether it's around, um, you know, funding organizations or education or other initiatives that help reduce the racial equity gap, right, from a socioeconomic perspective, that's possibly the simplest route, right, to commit a certain set of funding and then let the right organizations get on with it. I think there's a second more impactful commitment as well, which is around contributing the expertise and skills that an organization has to the right causes, right? So if we picked, you know, helping small businesses or diverse set of suppliers, which would primarily be small to mid-sized businesses, apart from actually funding to give them some support in growing their businesses, Right. The other opportunity would be to make the right products and solutions available to them, to educate them on how to better manage their cash flow and give them the right tools and support to help grow their businesses. Because you have access to developing the right products and solutions and also a very good understanding of how these businesses could better manage their financials. So that's just one example. But deploying the skills and expertise and the distribution network of corporations as large as ours is certainly something that's going to drive more sustainable long-term impact than one or a couple of rounds of funding. That's awesome. Let's pause for a moment. We'll be right back. So, and in your... I want to dive in because I think in some cases you sit in a unique position being having had the ear of, you know, CEOs and your chief of staff positions, you know, that is also such a critical element that CEOs have a, a, the level of expertise at their disposal at that time. I think that's why we see so many people that are you know, moving to chief diversity officers that are sitting at the table with the CEO, with the executive committees. In your role, are there other things that maybe we can tap into? Because I think there's so many different ways that people are attacking diversity, equity, and inclusion just organizationally. Are there, you know, specific benefits? I know you bring lots of benefits because you, you bring that expertise to that level. Are there things that people that are further down in the organization might be able to do in order to channel that type of momentum that you uh, that you bring to the table? I think, Melissa, that's a fantastic point, right? Because there's only so much you can drive top down. And um, we certainly can't set up a huge and you know massively resourced diversity, equity, and inclusion team. So Certainly something that organizations need to do is give the chief diversity officer a seat at the table, which we've successfully managed to do. But I think the other component of is how do we mobilize a network of passionate employees to then take that strategy and those objectives and translate them into real actions for the business lines and the broader set of employees, right? And I, in particular, have the opportunity and privilege this year to be what we call the diversity, equity, and inclusion champion. So we have a number of champions across our business who sit in the different business lines and therefore understand how the business works and operates, are very well connected with the employees, and able to drive that momentum, partly through awareness, partly through specific initiatives 
and inviting other employees, therefore, to be a part of that movement and execute some of the actions because none of these just get done by one small team of people or making a change to our policies or rolling out some educational initiatives alone. All of this has to be done in conjunction. And the real success factor is the more employees that get engaged and motivated by this, the more success you're going to have. One of the other um, great success factors is the business resource groups, which are employee led But one of the interesting um, components to it is they could be employee led. And then a lot of what they could be doing is just event led a number of webinars, networking, some bit of skills development and the like. A lot of it doesn't come to life unless you have your leaders signed up to it, not just in terms of turning up to all of these different options. But then building that into things like talent management, business development, and so on. So to give you an example, right, if one of the objectives of a women's-based business resource group is to support the skills development that help women advance in leadership positions, if the leadership is signed up to it, especially all the C-suite executives, then they are actually guiding that process to say, here are the skills that we look for as women progress to leadership positions. You would help by focusing on these things in particular. And I'm happy to turn up and actually support and facilitate that process and give you insight into how we think from an executive perspective, right? And equally to then if somebody's actually made the effort of developing those skills to build that back into the talent management process and assess them for their potential. So that's just an example of how the two interplay. And therefore, a combination of these informal champions, as well as these business resource groups, are just a couple of examples of how we mobilize more people and pull them in to drive not just the communication and the message, but actual actions that help us all. Yeah. And we have, we actually have, it's interesting that you mentioned all of those things because I do, I do come back to a point you made about, you know, not doing it off the side of your desk and really kind of focusing, but yet we, we have so many employees that do it off the side of their desk. I mean, it is a volunteer labor of love, a thankless job in many cases, but it is progressing and moving the business forward in ways that they will probably not even understand for generations to come. And so, you know, they are leaving their legacy. Those, you know, hidden figures, as I like to call them, that are actually doing the day-to-day, making the decisions, helping to move the needle one way or the other. And so, What are some things that maybe could motivate people to stay engaged if they, you know, because I think I know for me after, you know, kind of the uh, the George Floyd murder, for example, I mean, there was just a sense of sheer exhaustion. You know, it's like, you know, you continue to try and try and try and then you work and then you see something like that. And it's like, you know, like what is happening? Like and we had a lot of people allies alike just come and say, you know, like, I didn't realize that the experience that, you know, you have. And it was almost like I knew there was something there, but it's way worse than I thought kind of thing. And so there was this sense of trying to get a deeper understanding and creating that awareness. So when you talk about awareness there are these levels of awareness that, you know, when, when people are thinking about their own bias, they don't go deeper. You know, it's that fifth question, right? Where you're really digging into why do I feel this way? You know? So it's interesting. Are there things that, that you do to kind of inspire and motivate you to keep, keep going? So I think Melissa, you've made such a solid point in terms of we don't go deep enough, right? And like I said, right, educational programs or, you know, training programs can only take us so far. It's the actual behaviors that we execute as a result of that, which will make more of a difference. And I think the basic principle for that is 
Do we listen enough? Do we give everybody an opportunity to be heard? That's, I think, step one in general. It's not got to do with gender. It's not got to do just with minority groups. It could be a range of different factors. We are sometimes great at building diverse representation at the table. But do we consciously seek out the views and perspectives of that diverse set of people at the table? Because we do not appreciate enough that not everybody will be able to speak up without being prompted. Some people need to be encouraged and supported to be able to speak up and provide their view on a certain situation. So step one really is to listen and understand and give that equal opportunity. And when I say equal, it's not good enough to say, We're all in an open meeting or in an open discussion. Everybody has the opportunity to contribute. We need to do a little bit more than that to move from that equality to equity state of mind where we are actually helping some other people come to the same level playing field. If we get that right, the next stage then is valuing and respecting those diverse perspectives which don't look and feel and sound like our own right? It's again, not great if you are okay to hear everyone out because you want to tick the box and said, I'm doing the right thing. And I've heard everyone around the table, but my opinion is still valid, right? Without actually incorporating that input. So I think that's where we should be moving towards in terms of start to listen and truly comprehend. Because like you said, right, some of these things have existed for the longest time. It's not just the murder of George Floyd that brought out these differences or these atrocities or the discrimination. It's just that we have not observed well enough, understood well enough, or probed enough, or really listened to what was happening around us, right? So we've not been able to work ourselves through the noise that exists to understand it really well. So if we get that right, we will be able to elevate ourselves to that level of, okay, now I understand what it means. How do I ensure that I value what that means for people who don't look, feel, and sound like me? Yeah, that's definitely the key. I think, um, and it's so funny because I think what I have learned over the last few months, especially, is just leaving space for people to actually allow them to speak. I think people don't realize how often they just speak over people. And then all of a sudden the meeting's over and you didn't get to say a word because, because they didn't give you the space to actually you know, participate without you interrupting. <laughs> so I would be remiss if I didn't ask, How has, I mean, I think everybody's been in COVID now for so long and, you know, we're sheltered in place, many of us working from home. And how has that changed the, you know, not only the activities, obviously, which have likely had to gone virtual, but have you seen a shift or, you know, I know I've seen a lot of focus on, you know, just mentality and being well and, you know, focusing there. Is there a diversity uh, and and inclusion element to making sure that we connect with folks as they are dealing with this whole COVID situation? So, um, Melissa, I certainly think that there has been an impact, some positive and some not so great. So let's talk about the positives first, right? As a lot of people have pointed out, right, everyone is now a square on a web conference and therefore technically everybody has an equal position in a virtual meeting setup, right, which is great, which means that no one is more important or less important than the other and therefore has an opportunity to participate and be seen and not get left out right? Which is brilliant. You spoke about the focus on well-being and mental health, which again has come to the fore. And also, like I spoke about, right, the adverse effect of the pandemic and the aftermath of the George Floyd killing, bringing to the fore how our 
ethnic minority groups and other minority groups are most impacted with these kind of catastrophic situations, right? So that's certainly come to the play and therefore become ever more important, both from an overall well-being perspective, as well as are we doing more to make our colleagues feel truly included, right? So there's definitely a focus on that and therefore uh, virtual events that focus on that as well as the business resource groups, those those activities have certainly stepped up and become a lot more prevalent and with a lot of leadership focus as well. I think the places where we still need to do a lot of work on is, like you said, right, often, even when we get into these virtual meeting situations, we are in such a rush to get so much done that we're just so focused on the outcome of those conversations that we don't really think about the process of how we get there. And that's something that has become even more challenging in virtual environments because we miss that, you know, slight facial reaction or that expression or that ability to truly include everyone who's in a room. And so that is something that still needs a lot of work, especially in a virtual environment to really ensure that everyone is truly a part of conversations and being able to contribute. I think the other aspect of this is isolation, right? We risk um, in a physical environment, it's difficult to miss someone, right? You'd run into them into a break room, you'd run into them in a meeting, you'd run into them on your way to work or back from work or the like, right? So you can't really see through people And, you know, even if you weren't in a meeting with them on a a particular day, you would have the likelihood of running into them in one form or the other, and therefore they would be constantly top of mind. In a virtual environment, you could find that there are certain sets of people whom you are isolating on account of the fact that you're actually not physically with them, and therefore that could put certain people even further back than they originally were, right? And there's a lot of research and surveys that have been done on the impact on women and as well on other minority groups, right? In terms of dropping out of the workforce because of not being able to manage the work and home balance or childcare responsibilities in particular, or just not feeling able to cope with the demands of this new environment. So we have the potential to further make these situations even worse than they were in a physical environment because we are not able to see and observe all of those different things that are unfolding in a virtual environment scenario. So the I think the final thing really on that is that a lot of efforts that were in play, right, either from a leadership commitment or a funding perspective to drive certain big scale things in organizations around a lot of DEI initiatives, There has been a lot of, um, you know, pauses and stop starts also for some of those things because of the environment that we operate in. We can no longer do physical events. So what does networking look like? It's taken some organizations longer than others to determine, okay, how do we pivot? How do we change how we get feedback from employees? Are we still doing an annual engagement survey or do we need more quick pulse uh, feedback? Are we still able to plan for some future physical events or should we just get on and find a new way to do virtual events? So it's taken quite a while to pivot and therefore some of the great things that were in momentum and in play suddenly, you know, got paused or halted and it took quite a while for the world to evolve to get to a new working normal and continue some of those things. Yeah, that was, those are, I mean, What's funny to me is I think about, you know, the coffee chat, you know, where people used to, a lot of the senior leaders would say, hey, I'll do like a coffee chat or whatever. Well, doing that virtually is kind of really awkward. (laughs) And so I'm kind of like, you know, when you do different meetings, it's just not the same. You know, when you, you know, picking up a pastry and having a cup of coffee with somebody in the room and then looking at them on screen while you're drinking a cup of coffee, it is not the same. <laughs> yep. so, so I think, you know, it's funny because I think, you know, the new norm will be something different, but I think everybody's still realizing how valuable the connection kind of person to person really is. 
and you can do a lot. Um, you know, there are people that have started working in, in my company that I have never actually seen yet, you know, because they started during COVID and, you know, it's like almost a year has gone by. We have a great working relationship and yet we have no, you know, we actually haven't been in the same room together. So it's funny how you can, you can really create the relationship, but there's kind of that yearn for, you know, that connection. So you know, I'm hoping that whatever we comes out of it is even better than what we have had in the past. So learning how to connect to people. And I can't thank you enough for joining me and having this conversation. I think, you know, all of the things you said pose so many different opportunities for people to jump in, whether they're an employee, a CEO, whether they work at a company or in the community, how you can get involved in managing diversity, equity, and inclusion, and really creating the social impact we need. So thank you so much for all the work that you do. And I'm really excited. Uh, Hopefully we will stay in touch and we'll continue to follow you and watch you thrive. So thanks for being here. Well, Melissa, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, In my conversations with you, not just this one, but previous ones as well, I think you're an inspiration to a number of us for actually driving not just the conversations with a number of amazing people around the globe across different companies and share some insights on what they're doing really well, but just relentlessly pursuing that agenda of moving forward on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So thank you for having me in this conversation. Thank you so much, Akira. Thanks for joining me on the Jolly Podcast. Please subscribe so you won't miss an episode. See you next week.